So far, I've been talking about traditional electromagnetic frequency research. Uh, I want to talk about some of the things that have been mentioned that are not mentioned and are not generally accepted in the public yet as truly being in existence. Um, I've mentioned Eldon Bird a few times. And Eldon Bird died several years ago. He's a former chief medical officer for the U.S. Navy. He was involved in their non-lethal weapons research. He was a member of the U.S. Psychotronics Association, BYRD. He appeared at uh, the, the mind control conferences that Marianne Stratton put on in 2000, 2001, 2002. I've gotten several of the videos from Marianne so that I could research them. Eldon Bird is a man that knows a lot. He died uh, from cancer not too long ago. Died from pancreatic cancer. In 1980 to 1981, he worked with Ross Aidey, who was somebody that uh, worked down at Loma Linda University researching the Russian Lita machine, the effect of microwaves and radio frequencies on calcium influx. And that's what's believed to be a lot of the effect of what these radio frequencies cause as they work on your calcium channels. Uh, but he worked with Ross Aidey and Elizabeth Rosher on the ability to entrain human brains at a distance. And he said, we accomplished it. 1980. His project went dark after that. It was taken away from him. He had it confirmed from a senator, Senator Pell, confirmed for him that his project went dark. The things that I would recommend, and this is kind of off topic here, uh, these energies are known to cause an increase in free radicals. Free radicals are known to cause cancer. Uh, if you take antioxidants, they will help to decrease the amount of free radicals that you have. I recommend to everybody that you take vitamin E, vitamin C, and selenium. I recommend that you exercise regularly and that you eat healthy. You know, here in, in our country, we are taught traditional medicine. We're taught you have a problem, it's something with the organ, it's with the receptor, you give them a drug, that makes it better. Not realizing that every receptor causes an electrochemical reaction. Or not focusing on that, we know that. Eastern medicine has long focused on viewing the body and the spirit as an electrochemical being. Um, I don't rule anything out. I think there's probably something to healing frequencies. Um, anyway, back to Dr. Bird. I got a copy of the DVD from Marianne. There's not many going around. I strongly recommend that you guys listen to Dr. Bird. If you go back into the go to the Freedom website, there's a weekly newsletter that's put out, and I believe it was back in June or July. Marianne had mailed in a copy of the voice, the, the audio program from this DVD, and you can listen to his entire lecture on there. This is a smart man, and he's talking about stuff that's way over my head. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what he mentions, because he talks about there's some things that may be going on that we don't, that traditional science doesn't understand yet. Anyway, I'm going to read this quote from him. It says that technology exists to induce sound into the brain at a distance, monitor and alter brain waves at a distance, alter behavior at a distance, induce images into the brain can target individual organs, can disrupt the calcium ions binding on individual cell surfaces at a distance, creating pain and other effects, that we have moved beyond the realm of the electromagnetic spectrum into the realm of hyperspace, scalar energy, and quantum mechanics. This is something I don't understand well, and it's an evolving science. There are energies that work at a subatomic level, okay? Tom Bearden. If you want research, go look at Tom Bearden's stuff. You talk about this to most people, they say it's, it's never been admitted to be true. And that's probably because it's being kept hidden. And I'll allude to more of that later. Anyway, he goes on to say, We have demonstrated the ability of cluster and magnetic fields to alter DNA and to control biochemical processes. Mind control technology exists without a question. That's Dr. Bird. He's talking about the ability to use frequencies to alter your DNA, to induce tumors, to target specific organs. If you look at the research that was done with radiation frequencies, uh, I believe it was the University of Utah back in 1989, 
produced the radiation dosimetry handbook. Your body, in addition to being an electromagnetic organism, is a vibratory organism. Your body vibrates. Everything vibrates. To understand the concept of resonance, we've all seen the opera singer that hits that certain note and breaks the glass. That's because her pitch is vibrating as the same pitch that the glass is. They work together and accentuate each other. The vibration becomes too much, the glass breaks. Each organ in your body vibrates at an individual frequency. Those frequencies are now known. They're in the radiation dosimetry handbook. If we're able to direct a frequency at your body that vibrates at the same frequency as an organ, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing good. Um, Dr. Bird also stated that the Marines, and this is from his Psychotronics Association lecture, and supposedly that lecture is available if you go to their site. It's from the 2000 U.S. Psychotronics Association lecture. The Marines have been shown that images can be projected into the brain from a distance. So we're training our soldiers that this happens now. Anybody know any former Marines? Okay. He also specifically stated, he said that a squid magnetometer can detect these unusual frequencies that are being directed at individuals. Um, now we've got magnetoencephalograms, which are very huge, large machines that are, are a step above MRIs, but they're stationary. There's very few places around the country that have them. Uh, the one thing that he also stated, and I'm sure, I guess it, it can't be validated, uh, but he says, according to him, and he also worked for NASA, NASA gave law enforcement the access to voice induction technology. So law enforcement's able to use this to harass who they want to or to get information. These are information acquiring weapons. If we're able to get your EEG, decode your thought patterns, we know what you're thinking. You think there's corporations out there? that wouldn't want this technology to use it on their competitors. This organization, FFCHS, has we've researched a lot of private investigators. People that claim to be able to detect radio frequencies, find chips, scans, things of that nature. Uh, one of the people that I have personally talked with, and I've talked with him about some of his results, and I'm not going to mention him by name. He wouldn't come here. He said, I don't want to talk with somebody as a group. Reason being is that uh, since he became involved with helping people in the Freedom Group, uh, he said, on one of my stakeouts, my men were assaulted and threatened and told if they kept up, they will be killed. And he's come up with some interesting things. This is somebody that's, that has 22 years of experience with this. He's got an international corporation. He said the bulk of the, the stuff that he was doing was over in Asia because this type of technology was being used for corporate espionage. He said we were able to track and triangulate frequencies, figure out where they were coming from. We've used it successfully in prosecution. I thought this sounded like a pretty good guy for us to use. He doesn't come cheap, I'll tell you that. A couple people have used it. And the results of what he said from the first person or one of the first people he uh, worked with was we've never seen results like this before. We've got radio frequencies coming in that should not be there. They're coming from multiple directions and multiple frequencies. They're multidirectional. And they don't know, I mean, they can't triangulate it because it's coming from her. He said, we don't know if these are, you know, they're putting some frequencies in there to disguise the other ones or if this is something new. And then after that initial experience, he said, I've had this come up with several people now. He said, I've got my own researchers figuring out how to do this. Um, I haven't met this guy personally. I've talked with him multiple, multiple times. I may have a meeting with him sometime in the not too distant future I find him to be credible um, he's at least been willing to keep an open line of communication with me he at this point he is he's gun shy one of the other investigators there was an investigator by the name of Ron Rhodes and Mark Sosman that appeared at all three of Marianne Stratton's conferences they were based out of Long Beach California they had a investigative agency called Spectrum Intelligence International Network 
and Ron also has lectures that are available. Uh, Ron specifically it states that he believes scalar waves are being used yeah. because scalars, he said, you cannot triangulate them. He said we can detect them, but we can't figure out where they're coming from. And you got to remember, the scalar waves work at a subatomic level. They go to the very core of what you are. A scalar wave, from my understanding, most waves, if you look at a waveform, they are sinusoidal. Electronic waveforms are sinusoidal. A microwave has a square front. So instead of like this, it is like this. It is that square front that allows it to penetrate tissue. A scalar wave, from my understanding, is longitudinal. It is flat. My understanding is that scalars can exist in two places at the same time. They can exist on the other side of the world the same time they exist here. I don't know that enough about them. It's, it's the emerging world of new physics, quantum mechanics. Like I said, physics was not my strong point. <laughs> I was a biology major, okay? I find this stuff interesting, but this may be the clue to what we're dealing with here, okay? We have to consider that. If they're going to explore everything else, don't we think they'd want to explore a new physics? I think they would. So, is anybody not convinced that we've been researching this stuff? Anybody not convinced that we've done experimentation without people's consent in the past? You people here in San Francisco know they dropped anthrax over your city in the, in the 50s, don't you? They dropped cadmium over Canada, same time. They even released mosquitoes in Georgia that had dengue fever. Peter. Um, what, I'm, what I'm hearing, I'm, I want to put, try to put this in context, because when we did the study that Cheryl funded it, us for four years ago, and it's on our website, documented the auditory, the, the weapon systems, the history of the entail for the whole thing. <laughs> so it's laid out in a nice little academic paper. My thoughts about it since for the last four years are, Okay, who gets targeted and why? Right. Is there a commonality? And can get we've been, you know, thinking that that was a step to take next. Mm -hmm. If we could find that. But I'm, what I'm hearing is that maybe partly it's experimental. Partly it could just be random people selected. Or I also hear it could be people who are targeted for political reasons. Um, the technologies are there, and there's a variety of different things that, that can happen. I had never thought about pancreatic cancer before. But, um, so the same thing happened with the 9-11 groups. They kept saying they. Who, who are they? And so we did some research a few years ago and started to put some parameters on they, and the neocons and the, and the uh, particularly the... the, the Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and those companies that get almost all of their financing from the government. But there's an interlock there, very tight. So when we were looking at electromagnetic weapons and the conferences that they were having, there's Lockheed Martin, there's Northrop Grumman, there's SAIC participating in a very open way. It's all, it's all secret, but we can see the agendas, mm -hmm. lethality of electromagnetic weapons. That, you know, These were the things they discussed, all of the private. So I think, again, what we're thinking about are, are who, who is they that has these capabilities. And I would imagine that there's probably some pretty good overlap with what we, the parameters we put in relative to 9-11. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the power elite, the, mm -hmm. trans, you know, the transnational corporate elite, and the agents that work for them, um, mm -hmm. both public and private. I would, so, I would agree. I, I would I, I and again, this is speculation, but if you look at what's gone on in the last decade, and I'm going, to, I'm going to cover exactly who the targets are. That's a good segue. I'm glad you brought that up. You're right. It is mostly random. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's mostly random. It, there's there's some, some commonalities, but it's mostly random. You know, we now live in a world in our country where look how much money is into the security business now, intelligence. It has grown into a multi multi billion dollar industry since 911. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made by developing these technologies. They're probably all trying to one up each other, uh, testing on whoever, 
that's our one of our biggest questions is who's got access to these technologies it's probably not just military is military going to go about just using this on citizens picking them at random corporations you know ex military ex intelligence that has access to it uh people in civilian law enforcement it probably covers the whole gamut it would have to almost if you think about it reference to you're you're defining the parameters of today one of the problems too that uh, i've got close ties with some people in various intelligence organizations um there's been such a revolving door in the intelligence community as far as people being trained through the NSA, the CIA, or the National Clandestine Service, and then taking jobs with private intelligence companies. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'll have people in this, especially within the CIA, that for you know 10 years they're an employee of the CIA. They get on with a private company, Booz Allen Hamilton, CACI, SACI, Mantech, you know, or some of these organizations. A week later, they're back at the CIA office with a different kind of badge on, doing the same job, making three times the pay. You know, there are 800,000 people in this country now that are private citizens with top secret clearances uh, through the government that would have access to this technology, some of them, I would imagine. The case in point is Igor Smirnov's technology. After he passed away, his wife started looking for uh, North American investors in his technology. She went to Canada first. Actually, uh, I believe she went to John Alexander's company, SciTech. Uh, yep. the, the technology wound up being bought by Mantech, which is based out of San Antonio, Texas, and has nothing but private uh, surveillance and intelligence contracts with the U.S. government. Yeah. Well, I do believe that SciTech, SciTech supposedly bought the uh, the rights to Smirnoff's technology as well. Mantech and bought the whole shebang. They bought SciTech. Okay. The fact of the matter is, it's it's bought by a it's bought by a non-governmental independent company. But I was going to say, I'm going to go over the demographics, and FFCHS has over a thousand members now. There's a community survey profile that's done that kind of gathers some basic data, and that's what I'm going to go over now. Who are the, the people that are responding to this? Who are the targets? Um, a year ago, we had 416 people that responded, and there were about 600 people that uh, were dues-paying members of FFCHS. Now it's about 1,000, and there's 775 respondents. Um, what I got from looking at the new data compared to the data from a year ago, it's, the data's almost doubled in size. The percentages haven't changed any. So what that tells me is the data is consistent, it's accurate, and it's reproducible. The people that are reporting being targeted have the same demographic profile. They're reporting the same things occurring to them. Okay? Uh, Just FYI, California, I guess there's 109 people uh, from California that belong to the group. Anyway, average age, 8% of the people are under 30, 21% uh, less than 40. Most of the people are age 40 or over. 60% 60% over age 40. So the average person is over age 40. All right. Overall, 70% over 40. Uh, last year, it was about 80% were 40. So it's changed just, just briefly. 60% are females. 60. That has not changed. Here's what's interesting. 84% of these people are single, divorced, or separated. 40% never married. Individuals are easy targets. They live by themselves. Mm -hmm. It's easy to isolate them. We know about the torture tactics they use in Guantanamo. You put people in solitary. You isolate them. People have reported they have poor, poor support systems. Not a lot of family around. Not a lot of friends. And once you start... Dealing with this stuff, you got less friends hanging around, okay? Because they all think you're nuts, <laughs> especially if you say anything to them. Seventy-six percent are Caucasian. Seventy-six. Here's a real interesting one: education level. This is an educated group of people. Ninety percent graduated high school. Fifty percent have graduated college or have a postgraduate degree, 14% have a master's or doctoral degree. 
I didn't think much about that. I went and looked at, in 2006, the American Community Survey said that our nation has a 27% college graduation and 10% are graduates or professionals. 50% of the people in this group are college graduates. 15 versus 10 are doctors or post-graduates. This is an intelligent, educated group. Let's go after smart people with poor family structure systems that are alone. Okay? Now here's something else. Out of this highly educated group, 60% are unemployed. They don't have finances to fight back with. Now whether or not that's a result, whether or not they became unemployed afterwards or before, I don't know. I've come up with a new survey that I'll get into that later, okay? Of the people that are employed, that 40%, 60% have professional jobs. Only 40% are unskilled or trade labor. These are the people that are highly functioning and dealing with this stuff, okay? As far as where, California's number two, New York is number one. California, Texas, New York's 22% of the, the group, California's 16 Florida is 6%, Texas is 5 and then the only other two above 3% are Connecticut and Arizona. The thousand people that I'm getting are people that have uh, actually paid dues to be a member of the organization. And it's a nominal due fee. It's like $15 a year, I think. I'll talk more in a bit here about why we need more people. Here's a... Uh, I, I label this next one as who's not helping. <laughs> one of the things they did was they asked, have you ever gone to the police, the FBI, or your state representative? And... Uh, 60% reported to the police, 45% to the FBI, 45% to their state representatives. Uh, of the people that directly helped out of that, it's, it's less than 10% said, well, I'll actually help you. Most of them referred them on, ignored them. Um, the interesting thing, how many of them referred them for psychological evaluation? Are you going to walk into the cop station telling them you're hearing voices and your neighbor's beaming directly energy weapons at you or whatever you think it is? That's the common thing we hear because everybody thinks it has to be going on next door. It's probably not. This is a psychological game. Okay? It's a very well orchestrated psychological game. The FBI and the representatives are so much nicer. Only about 12 to 15 percent of the time did they refer you for psychological evaluation. Local law enforcement, 42 percent. You got a 50-50 shot of... Uh, getting uh, involuntarily committed if you go into the cops. You could call that a 50 shot. That's what that's the code here, isn't it? Yeah, 5150. Yeah. Well, and the the thing I've I and I I think that is probably due to the way that the law enforcement is educated. That's what they're trained to do. You get somebody that's nuts coming in here, you're firm. And, and probably, I'll, I'll, I'll go back here. I was talking this morning with Ken, our, our retired law enforcement agent. And I said, I went back and looked through one of my psychiatric diagnosis handbooks, uh, Goodman and Goose, from like 1993 for my two-month psychiatry rotation that I did. So I'm no psychiatry expert. Right in there, almost word for word, it says in there, if you're complaining of being stalked of the government, uh, sending voices into your head. Th you know, it's almost like somebody read the script out of there that you're delusional or schizophrenic. Uh, the thing that I will tell you is schizophrenia, typical age of onset is teenager to early 20s. Like I said, this is a group of people that's over 40 years of age for the most part. I think we all have issues with the way that the dsm 4 criteria are made and used in this country. That's something that needs to be addressed, and that's one of, one of my missions and John's mission is, when can we get to the point where we can approach the medical community, the psychiatric community, with enough evidence to say, look, you've got to start considering something else besides just labeling people and putting them on medications. You know, 90% of the people complain of organized stalking, you know, being followed, community-based harassment, uh, computer tampering, email interference, appliance tampering, uh, electronic failures. 68% of the people become estranged after this starts, estranged from family and friends, furthers their isolation, okay? 
85 uh, percent complain of what they labeled directed energy weapons assaults, uh, basically complaining of the physical symptoms of sleep deprivation, induced sleep. We talked about that. Okay. Feeling hot spots on the body, feeling shocks or electrical currents running through your body, irregular heart rates. 23 percent complain of blackouts. Uh, 25 percent have burn marks on their body. They talk about dream manipulation, having thoughts induced. 52 percent have memory loss or declining cognitive functions. And that is known. That that's, goes along with the microwave sickness. Uh, declining neurocognitive function. The other thing that they learned went back when they did those studies uh, on the U.S. Embassy when they were just observing our people over there is that these are cumulative effects that occur over time. Uh, it can take up to 10 years before some of these symptoms will start manifesting, some of the physical symptoms from chronic EMF exposure. One of the things that I do want to focus on that just jumped off the page at me um, as far as physical symptoms was the occurrence of tinnitus or ear ringing. A lot of people complain of that. Um, the previous study showed that 79% of the people in this group complained of their ears ringing. Now it's down to 74. So I'm like, that sounds like a lot. So I went and did a little research. The average prevalence of tinnitus in the general population is between 5 and 20%. We've got a four-time higher rate in this group. Something's going on with this group that they're suffering ear ringing. Uh, males tend to get it more than females. And that's overall, not, not in this group. Uh, there, there's different things that cause tinnitus. Most of it's subjective. Uh, with subjective tinnitus, only you hear it. Uh, ob objective tinnitus, you go in, the physician can identify it, can hear it. Those are usually from vascular tumors, things of that nature. There are other causes of, of tinnitus. One of the things that does cause tinnitus, and I'm not going to get into the whole medical list of it here, um, if, if it's known to be subjective, it's usually perceived as being a, a ringing, high-pitched, humming, whistling. If it's vascular, it's usually more of a pulsing, throbbing, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. If you've ever had a cold, and you get clogged up, a lot of times you hear your pulse in your ear. That's vascular. Um, tinnitus is known to occur with chronic EMF and radio frequency exposures. You look at this survey data, we've identified a few things here. This is a unique group. Single, not married, educated, out of work. Okay? This is our target profile. This is who we're going after. All right? Um, there's some things that are not in this survey. We need a lot of refinements. Like I said, were these people unemployed before or after? It wasn't asked. The thing that gets me, nowhere in this survey did we ask if anybody is subjected to what are known as voice induction technologies. They are known as voice data image induction. That is the technical term for it. doesn't talk anything about that in the survey. That needs to be addressed. So... What do I want to do? I mean, one of the things that I, I'd like to get feedback here, you know, what can we do? We've got an organization here with a thousand people in it that we can collect data from, a thousand people that can contact other people. What can we do with this organization? And that's where I want suggestions. You know, some of the things, you know, I think we need to collect more data from them. We need to refine some of this data. Um, specifically, I want medical data. I want complete medical histories on these people. I want to start following these people and see whether they're developing problems down the road, you know. The biggest problems I see with this group are, are getting these people funding. Like we said, 60% are unemployed. They're giving 15 bucks a year to an organization to try to help them. We all know you don't get very far in this country, especially taking on these people without money. How do we raise funding? How do we raise public awareness? Uh, the FFCSH group's thinking about doing billboards. We've got a few supporters. Some of them are in the L.A. area. Starting to put up billboards to make awareness known. Funding drive. Okay. We need media support. Like I said, every one of these other illegal experiments, harassment programs, how did we find out about them? An investigative reporter 
reported on it. Well, then we'll get started. I am Dr. John Hall, I'm an anesthesiologist and a uh, chronic pain management doctor from um, San Antonio, Texas. A lot of people ask me, in your medical specialty, what brought you into this arena uh, to be combating this problem. I was engaged to a girl who was victimized uh, using this technology. Um, mainly the three, I guess the three tenants that we're really talking about are stalking, uh, also referred to as gang stalking. I call it organized stalking because gang stalking gives a lot of people the notion that it's guys in black jackets and, you know, wearing colors. It's not really that. It's a, it's a very pervasive form of organized stalking where uh, the person is followed, their home is broken into, things are tampered with, usually not stolen, uh, so that people don't get a burglary charge. Uh, street theater, where people walk around you, talking, people that don't know you, walking up to you, mentioning things about you that they wouldn't know unless they did know you. Combination of that with what I call audio harassment, which can be voice to skull, hearing voices in your head, usually starts with tinnitus or ringing in the ears, then progresses to voices, or hearing voices in your surroundings. By that I mean still frequency specific to the individual, but hearing voices in vibrations, ceiling fans, running water, vent fans, um, trees, uh, anything that will vibrate and finish carrying the sound. And it is distinctly different from what most people term voice to skull or the voices that you hear in your head. Third thing, um, usually while you're being audio harassed, being attacked with directed energy weapons that um, will either cause twitching of the muscles, uh, complete spasm of the muscles, even spasms of the whole body, changes in heart rate, severe heartburn, severe headaches, um, eye burning and blurred vision are just some of the more common ones. Um, I've had people uh, correspond with me that are having burning of the feet, burning of various parts of the body, the genitalia, uh, rectal burning, uh, very obviously reported as coming from the outside. Um, wrote a book on my experiences and experience with my fiance. It's called uh, A New Breed, Satellite Terrorism in America. There is a lot of um, disagreement on exactly what the modalities are, what the mode of delivery of this is. I know there are, are certain groups that are fighting this. There's a, several big groups of victims' advocacy groups, and some of them disagree with whether or not this is satellite. The mode of delivery really is not a, not a big issue. The fact that it's going on and that we need to document that it's going on is more of the, the fact. The reason I titled the book Satellite um, Terrorism in America, I do have contacts within some government agencies. I talk to current FBI agents and current CIA agents to verify the technology. When it started happening to my ex-fiancé and some other people in San Antonio, they did... Uh, um, basically let me know that yes we do now have the technology in our satellite surveillance systems to see you indoors using x-ray imaging or forward-looking infrared imaging and that there is a directed energy um, platform on the satellite system the weapons they mentioned were ultrasound microwave laser and particle beam um, most of those were actually meant to perturb electronic systems um, in a defense um, strategy, you would attack electronic equipment with these to make the electronic equipment go bad, shut down radar, things like that. But they can also be used to attack personnel. And that's what we started seeing with my ex fiance and other people in San Antonio. Um, burning sometimes to the point of leaving marks, usually not, which is what lends to the problem when you actually go seek a medical help. When you tell them you're being burned all over and you're having muscle twitching and you're hearing voices, the first thing you usually get is a referral to a psychiatrist who is not going to listen to you, who's not going to look into the research that has been done. And there is legitimate research on most of this technology that can be dug up. They don't want to hear it. Um, if you're hearing voices that they can't hear, if you're above the age, the cutoff to be diagnosed as schizophrenic, you'll be diagnosed with delusional disorder. Persecutory delusional disorder is what we most frequently see. Um, in San Antonio, we did target the people who were doing the stalking, which is what I recommend to the most of the people who contact me on my website. Don't try to go into the police and convince them of the surveillance technology. They're not going to know about it. This is not something that filters its way down usually to the cops on the street. Uh, it probably doesn't even filter its way down to the psychiatrist in various communities that you're actually going to see. At the top echelon, the people, they do know about it. American Academy of Psychiatrics was behind MK Ultra, MK Search, Bluebird, and a lot of other mind control technologies. They do know at the top. 
But the guy you get referred to that's going to actually give you a damning diagnosis probably isn't part of it and probably doesn't know much about the technology. It's been my experience in talking to other physicians. Um, we did um, trace our problem in San Antonio back to a private investigative agency that's owned by a former FBI agent and his son, who's a retired lieutenant colonel with the Department of Defense. They hired nothing but their own relatives that worked for them. They were the ones doing the stalking. We followed them back to the places that they do this from, um, kind of did our own casework on them. Most of this is being done from behind a computer with a headset, at least from what I could see. Now, I know there are advocacy groups out there that say, no, this is being done with handheld weapons you know, by your neighbor or by somebody in the apartment next to you. While that is possible, there are some manufacturers of handheld weapons. They would be hard to get a hold of for someone in the civilian sector unless you're doing like what Eleanor White has on her website, taking the door off a microwave and putting a funnel in it and using microwave energy to do it. That's going to be a, a scattered form of beam and not be able to be directed directly at a person as a rule. This is very uh, physiologically specific when the attacks occur. That's why... Once I saw my ex fiance and other people in San Antonio being attacked, it was very evident that the attacks were anatomically correct. The only way that can happen is to have some X-ray imaging or FLIR imaging where you're seeing the person and seeing the areas where you're attacking. With X-ray imaging, physiologic attack would be very easy. You can direct the directed energy weapons you know, at the jaws, at the nose, at the eyes, at the genitals, uh, bony protuberances where there's not much tissue over bone. Um, most of the pain you experience from directed energy attack is from the nerve endings that are in the periosteum or the covering of the bone uh, or soft tissue, mucous membranes. Uh, that's why the blurred vision, the nose bleeds, things like that are real easy to do. Um, muscle twitching that's very rhythmical. You can tell the impulse is coming from the outside. I mean, it won't be un uncommon to see people, you know, you can see they're being attacked and it's a, a rhythmical type of twitching. We followed the people back, found out where they're doing it from. Um, in my case, um, she was being drugged through a hypnol and being raped. We uh, hid voice-activated digital recorders in the condo. We did catch them breaking in after she was in a drug state. She's screaming at the um, people that uh, entered the condo. You can hear on the recording um, three male voices and one female voice. They're digging through her condo to find the voice-activated recorders which they initially did find. Uh, you can hear the voices right up next to the microphone saying, I found it, how do I shut it off? A male voice told the girl that found it, just hit some buttons until it shuts off, but they didn't know how to erase it, apparently. Uh, luckily, uh, most of my patients are SAPD, including the lieutenant in charge of the sex crimes unit. We took the voice-activated recorders to him with their plate numbers, with their identities. Uh, she did not have enough recall to bring prosecution for rape. We did stop the stalking, and that's why um, most of the victims, I, I tell them, get your plate numbers. If you're being stalked or you're being broken into, do the same thing. Set up digital audio voice-activated recorders. Get strong evidence of the breaking and entering and the stalking because the police will work with you on stalking. They will not work with you on stalking if you tell them I'm being stalked and I'm hearing voices and I'm being attacked with weapons I can't see. Because at that point, they're going to write you off as mentally ill, which is what the perpetrators want. Because once you've got that listing with the police, the second and third call, when you do call, even if they're in your home physically to do something to you, you're already blacklisted. And when it comes to the dispatch, they're going to say, well, that's the crazy person. And, you know, it's not happening. And they probably won't send somebody out. Um, there has been instances where these people have actually broken in while the victim is aware. Um, in San Antonio, there's three, two, three other couples and several single women that are being victimized by the same um, former FBI guy running a PI group now. Um, one of them was lured to San Antonio uh, from New York City. She was told online by someone that got on one of the victim's advocacy websites that she could come to San Antonio, there was affordable housing, and none of this was happening in San Antonio, that she'd be safe in San Antonio. They put her up in a seedy apartment complex. She's being drugged with hypnol and raped on a daily basis and used as a sex slave. Her uh, friends and family got a hold of me to find her. I did find her. We've got her actually in a rape crisis center where some people can watch her now. But... Uh, they, uh, they definitely got her down there and had her uh, in a state where she couldn't help herself. They be the PI group. Um, 
she did, uh, they changed their last names, but all of the first names they were still using were the same. Uh, so I've got her in touch with SAPD to try to get some work done with that. The reason for the meeting today was for people to see that this is really going on. Um, the technological advancements that they've made in directed energy and radio frequency weapons is amazing. Um, I think the mode of delivery is mostly coming from satellite, possibly HARP. I know Dr. Nick Begich has written some books on HARP. From what I know about HARP, I don't see how HARP can be used to be directed so specifically at a bunch of multiple individuals. But I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know a lot about HARP. Satellite, on the other hand, um, it does have the ability to, to direct itself or be directed at multiple individuals simultaneously. This is now happening in every single state. Um, I know there's Cheryl Welch's Mind Justice, there's Freedom from Covert Harassment uh, and Surveillance and Harassment. Uh, there's several other uh, advocacy groups. All of these groups now have, I think Freedom has 600, 600 700 members. Yeah, 1,000. I don't know how many Cheryl has. I've personally corresponded with probably over a thousand victims now. Um, the only place that we're not seeing the full template, the stalking, the voices, and the uh, attacks, believe it or not, are in like the Dakotas in the sparsely populated regions. Most of those victims are complaining of just directed energy attack and just audio harassment. They're not experiencing much stalking, and I think that's uh, secondary to basically being states where there's a limited population and they just don't have the boots on the ground to actually uh, do the rest of the, the template, the stalking. The breaking and entering, the stalking, the appliance tampering, um, I think is COINTELPRO. I think that's strictly psychological operations. Um, almost every victim will complain that people have broken into their houses and taken apart their refrigerator, taken apart their stove, and taken apart their microwave. I've heard it from a lot of victims, and I've seen it with every single case in San Antonio, including our own. Um, to be on the safe side, I have got friends that are PIs down there. We brought them in. We did the basic scans for cameras, uh, microphones, things like that. The taking apart of the appliances and the messing around in your home are strictly to put you in a victim mind state. They're usually not burying any surveillance equipment that's low-tech RF equipment that you can find. In my case, one of the girls in San Antonio was a girl who did my billing. We did find a camera hidden in a hollow door in her uh, bedroom. So far, that's the only one we found. And she actually found that incidentally because the battery came loose and she noticed something shaking in her door. And it was in a closet door that faced the bed. At her place, there always was somebody sitting outside her house in a car. It was very obviously radio frequency, and they had to have somebody out there with a receiver to pick it up. Most of those, uh, unless you're using a, um, an Internet-based camera, most of those are going to have a, a range where you have to have somebody within the area. The guy that uh, was sitting outside her house was the son of the former FBI guy that's one of the co-owners of the PI group. He is a retired lieutenant colonel with the Department of Defense. San Antonio is a little bit unique. Um, that a lot of these people have access to these weapons and this technology. We've got three NSA bases in San Antonio, one cryptology center, and Brooks City Base where all of this research is done for the armed services on directed energy. Um, I have a feeling that uh, these people either still have clearances and are able to access it. I think they're networking it out to other states because every victim, regardless of circumstance, has the same template going on. When you talk to the victims, everybody will have a different uh, scenario. They'll say, well, my scenario is a little different in that I'm having this or I'm having this. When you break it right down to the modality or the methods of attack, it's exactly the same in just about every case. Um, the stalking's the same. The breaking and entering the same. The attacks are, for the most part, the same, which tells me it's either being done with a template Somebody's being, these people are being given access to the technology and being given a handbook on how to use it, or they're all networking together. Now that I've seen what happened with this girl in New York City that was lured down to San Antonio, I think it's probably networking. Um, someplace, somewhere, was the original people who actually got their hands on this technology. We know that the government usually does this type of experimentation in an agency sterile fashion, so it's not traceable directly back to government agencies. In MK Ultra, they used front companies. Um, most of the people that I've dealt with, there's a, a law firm or a private investigative agency somewhere in the mix, you know, especially in yours. Um, most big 
uh, law, uh, law firms use PIs to do their dirty work. Um, the same with the group that I wrote about in San Antonio. They worked for a very big medical malpractice um, a firm in San Antonio, Texas. So I think that's why we're seeing the same template uh, from state to state. I don't know of one state that doesn't have at least two or three victims. That's also smart on the perpetrator's part because um, I think if one community psychiatrist all of a sudden had 20 people from one city come in voicing these complaints, even they would see it as something other than mental illness. You know, whether they saw it as environmental exposure to something that's causing the symptoms, they may not necessarily see it as attack, but they would see it as, as a different causative agent other than organic illness. But when you have two or three victims in every major city or every city coming forward and not one single mental health professional seeing a multitude of people with these complaints, it's easy for each city to have a handful of people that are being diagnosed as delusional or schizophrenic rather than one mental health professional say, you know what, I've got ten people in here, they're all hearing voices, they're all being attacked with something, and they're all being stalked. And it's very important to really focus on the stalking and the breaking and entering. Um, that is going to be what actually gets us to the bottom of this and get us to identify which groups are actually doing this in each city. Because um, going to the police are not, obviously not going to help at least not until there's hard enough evidence uh, where they can actually get into someone's house, find the computers that they're using, and go from there. And that's why it's going to be very important to focus on the stalking. Um, I know that's hard to do. The victims say, well, I have all this other stuff going on. You're not going to make them believe it. You're certainly not going to make a psychiatrist believe it until we can find out a way, which is one of the goals of this meeting, uh, especially with Peter and, and some of the academic people, to get some literature within the psychiatric community to show them that the technology does now exist to put voices in your head. Um, if you look at the um, uh, addendum to the bioeffects of non-lethal weapons that actually came out in 96, the Army stated it as clear as day in that uh, their research, we now have the ability to put voices in someone's head. Imagine the incapacitating effects on an enemy combatant when they hear voices in their head that are not their own. And they go on to talk about its value in a hostage situation where they can communicate with the hostages without the hostage taker hearing. They also go on to say that it's not recordable. Um, even with the uh, microphones in the ear on the scalp, that you cannot record the voices that are being transmitted inside the head. So the data is out there. It's just a matter of putting the correct data in the correct format by credible people in front of the psychiatric community to get them to say, when people come to tell you they're hearing voices and they're being stalked, look for another cause besides mental illness before you give someone a damning diagnosis. Um, that's why we're here, um, to get some other people's views on this, to try to work together, those of us that have some credibility, to force this into a, an educational system for psychiatrists, um, educate the public. If you know what this is, the minute it starts happening to you, you know not to run to your doctor who's going to send you to a psychiatrist. You know the right things to say to the police. What's happening is when it first starts happening, people are, are so messed up uh, that they end up presenting themselves in a wrong way. Some of that, I think, is when you're first attacked by this, we have anecdotal evidence to show that dopamine levels actually increase the brain when you're initially attacked. Um, increased dopamine will give you a schizophrenic type of appearance. Uh, matter of fact, um, excess dopamine was called the, the dopamine theory of schizophrenia. For years, they thought that schizophrenia was caused by excess dopamine. All of the drugs we treat schizophrenia with lower dopamine levels. Over time, as your dopamine receptors downregulate, the initial paranoia of these attacks slowly subsides, and you kind of regain a normal life. But I have sat with victims that are a week, a month into being attacked, and one case in point was a young man in San Antonio, Texas. I sat outside at a Starbucks talking to him. Every car that drove by was part of it. Every person that sat around us was part of it. Everybody that walked by with a cup of coffee was part of it and listening to what we were saying. Um, he had dark circles under his eyes. He was very hypervigilant. And that is a function of increased dopamine. Um, I've talked to Dr. Robert Duncan, who used to be with DARPA, who's done a lot of research on this technology. He agrees with that, too. That's one of the reasons we're trying our best to get through freedom from covert surveillance and harassment, some urine testing, uh, and some surveys through where we can actually box ship um, vials to the individuals, get their urine. 
if we can show in 600 people that everybody has increased dopamine levels, especially the people that are under active attack, that will go a long way as far as having some hard evidence that we can go in front of Congress with. Um, that almost has to be one of the factors that's causing the, the initial appearance of some of these victims. And every single one of them I've talked to during their initial attacks has that paranoid, schizophrenic look in their eye. And I think it's a result of increased dopamine. So that's kind of where we're headed. Terry's worked on an extensive survey to break down statistically exactly what the attacks are doing and, and uh, so we can have percentages and graphs in front of us, lab testing to check for neurotransmitter levels, specifically dopamine. But there are those of us in the medical community that do believe this or have experienced and we're, we're doing our best to, to try to get this on track. But uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to find some credible ways to do it. In looking at this from a physician, there's only two reasons to victimize somebody for a decade, and most of these victims have been victimized for a decade or more. Well, medically, the only studies that go on for a decade are behavioral studies and cancer studies, uh, and that's to see how long it takes before you can cost someone their job, cost someone their family and friends, and totally decimate them, or attack them long enough to make sure that this isn't going to cause some weird cancer in everybody. Um, the quickest way that would bring this to an end is if all of a sudden 20 people show up with some weird leukemia or some weird brain tumor um, that's not usually seen with any frequency in the population, all showing up at one area with the same cancer, well, then the CDC and you know people are going to take notice of that, that something's causing it, um, especially if they're planning on using this globally. Uh, to control everyone, they're going to need to know, well, in 10 years, is it going to cause leukemia? In 15 years, is it going to cause, you know, some type of a sarcoma? That's looking at it from a medical standpoint is the only, because you can decimate somebody's life in six months with this technology. You can have their job, have the money out of their account, have them diagnosed as delusional within a six-month period. There's no reason at that point to keep on victimizing that person for another decade. And one thing to share with you, I have been in correspondence with Colonel John Alexander, um, about this. He knew about the meeting. He actually sent me an email and he said, well, I'm the progenitor of the non-lethal weapons technology. I'm surprised that I wasn't invited to this meeting. So I invited him. I said, you know what? He, he said, what you're hearing from these victims is disinformation. It's not happening. It's physically impossible. And uh, he, he called it disinformation. So I said, well, you're more than invited to come and spread your version of the disinformation uh, at, the, at the meeting. And uh, he emailed me back and said that uh, to the people that are in contact with you that claim they're being attacked with directed energy, tell them to run, not walk, to the nearest mental institution.